The April 5th, 2023 meeting of the Ames Planning and Zoning Commission will come to order. The Planning and Zoning Commission is an independent advisory body of the City of Ames City Council. The Planning and Zoning Commission members are volunteers of the community and not part of the City Administration. The Planning and Zoning Commission is supported by staff from the City's Planning Division. The Commission is responsible for recommendations on matters involving subdivisions, annexations, master plans, and major site development plans, amendments to the zoning ordinance, and comprehensive plan amendments. We make our recommendations based on city codes, the facts presented, and input from the public. As an advisory commission, we welcome all comments regarding the proposed item. Please direct your input to the commission. If the proceedings become lengthy, we may ask that comments be focused on new information not previously presented. You may speak only once on an agenda item. If you wish to speak, please fill out a speaker information card uh, that are on the either outside on the on the table or here on the stand uh, and uh, and present the card to the recording secretary who is right back here. We ask that you come to the microphone to speak so that all comments may be recorded. The order of the proceeding for each item of the agenda will be as follows. City staff will present the staff report regarding the agenda item. Then commission members will have an opportunity to ask questions of city staff. The applicant will then be invited to make a statement regarding the request. Commission members will then have an opportunity to ask questions of the applicant. Members of the audience will then be invited to come forward and offer comments or questions. Once public comment is closed, city staff and the applicant will have an opportunity for concluding remarks. The commission will discuss the application based on all presentations and any comments given and come to a recommendation for the city council. The discussion may include further questions of city staff and the applicant for clarification. And with that, we'll move on to the first agenda item, which is introduction of commission members. So start Mike. Sure. Uh, Mike Sullivan. Mike Clayton. John Emery. Mike LaPetra. Matthew Voss. Jim Lickensdorf. And welcome, Matthew, to, to our, the Planning and Zoning Commission. Next item is the approval of the agenda. You all have the agenda in front of you. Is there any comments or would anybody like to make a move, motion to approve the agenda? So move. Second. I was before you vote. I'm just wondering, we did expect all the members to be here tonight, right? Yeah. I don't know if you want to defer item six maybe to later in the meeting or not. I know customarily we okay. do that right at the beginning, but okay. we, have, we have not heard that Julie's not coming. Okay, we'll uh, we'll hope, put it down after uh, after just item nine. Bring that up. Uh, and, then, and then if she's not here, we'll just go ahead with it. Okay. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. Approval of the minutes of March 15th, 2023. Are there any comments or concerns regarding the minutes? Is there a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Second. second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Next item is the public forum. Uh, this is intended to be a chance for anybody from the public who would like to come up and talk about an item that is not on the agenda tonight. This would be the time to do that. Is there anybody that would like to come up and speak on an item not on the agenda? Seeing none, I'll close the public forum. Moving to item seven, a public hearing on the preliminary plat for North Ridge, or excuse me, North Sunset Ridge at 9, 798 North 500th Avenue. And I understand the uh, applicant is not ready to continue yet. So uh, do we need to like take people action to move the, or to continue the uh, open public hearing? Yeah, so our recommendation is just to open the item. If somebody wanted to speak, they could. Okay. Um, we obviously didn't prepare a report. There's no plat to look at tonight. So what we're recommending is you open it. If someone wanted to speak, you can take that testimony. But then you would continue it indefinitely, and then we're going to re-notice when they've resubmitted a um, 
resubmitted the plat and okay. we're, are actually ready to go to PNZ. Okay. Is there anybody from the public that would like to speak on that item? Well, I was going to, but in the absence of the plat for anyone, um, et cetera, maybe we should wait till a different time. If they speak now, they won't be able to speak again, right? Well, we're going to re-notice it as a new item. It's, new, okay. yeah, so okay. it's not, it's not a situation where we're continuing the hearing with the intent of, of doing that. So really, um, it'll get a whole new notice. Okay. When we do it next so, time. Yeah, it, it's up to you. If you'd like to speak tonight, since you're here, uh, might as well. Uh, otherwise, do you all have plat map in front of you? We do not. No, because, we do not. So ultimately, let's the applicant. Yeah, let's just wait. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So ultimately, the applicant pulled back the plat that we had at the time we noticed it and said they might make some adjustments. No. So then we we did not put it on the agenda for approval. Okay. With that, then let's uh, continue that item. At a later date, when the uh, when the city and the uh, applicant are are ready to uh, move ahead with it, we need to vote on that. Uh, do we need to vote? Uh, yeah, to yeah. to continue okay. indefinitely would be okay. Should I have a motion to extend that uh, this item to another meeting in the, in the future when all parties are ready? Motion made. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Okay, item eight is the zoning text amendment on electric vehicle charging station setbacks. All right, so today we are, are addressing vehicle charging equipment. Uh, we gave you a couple of pictures. This is one of them that's in the staff report. The way we regulate equipment in our zoning ordinances, unless there's an exception in the ordinance specifically for something, everything has to meet setbacks. Uh, so vehicle charging equipment is something that obviously needs to be next to parking spaces. And as, as um, specifically Tesla, uh, some other entities have, have reached out to Ames Electric trying to understand how they could site equipment in the city, namely on existing sites. The, the questions that have come up is, is if we have existing sites and the parking spaces are within setbacks, what are the city's requirements then to put equipment in place to, to allow for electric vehicle charging? So after looking at this a little bit uh, and also reviewing what other cities have done, the city council decided to initiate a text amendment to allow for some encroachment into setback. So the, the key thing is that at least a 10 foot landscaped front yard setback would still be required. Uh, and then if that exists, what we're specifically talking about, so I'm gonna use this picture and I have a plan view also if you wanna look at that. So this has all of the pieces of a modern supercharger station that Tesla would install in it. You can see the green box set in the background. That's your, your standard transformer. <clears throat> Every four superchargers uh, will come with one of those larger white boxes as well. So commonly they're gonna to need to set a new transformer to power four or eight superchargers possibly a, a larger transformer on the site may be able to take care of that, but it's what we're seeing is it's likely you'd probably have to install a whole new transformer to power these things. And then with every four charging stations, you're gonna get one of those white box. So in this example, you have eight stations, you have two of those white boxes. Um, they Ideally, the white boxes are situated within a couple of feet of the chargers. Uh, I'm not an electrician or electrical engineer, but it does benefit them to have it that way. Uh, the transformer can be positioned in other places. They, uh, and they're, again, in their ideal scenario, everything is clustered together. It's the easiest thing for them to do. Uh, so if, if we were to move forward with this text amendment, the white components are the ones that could be as close as 10 feet to a property line along a street. Uh, the transformer would still need to meet setbacks. That's something that we do require now in the city. Um, if you are on a site that does not have 10 feet of front yard landscaping, which would not be uncommon for a lot of commercial sites that were probably built in the last 25 plus years, because we used to allow for, for parking lots to get as close as five feet to a sidewalk, you will not be able to take advantage of this. Uh, what we do have in here is that they could go into parking stalls. So we have an allowance that if the equipment needed to go into a parking stall to then be able to uh, support charging in those in those other stalls that is possible, but you would not be able to encroach into the front yard under this proposal if you do not have the ten feet. So if you're a newer if you're a newer site, uh, maybe you did not take advantage of the least setback possible. 
Uh, one site that we've looked at, which is the, the site plan that I can bring up, has a 20 foot front yard setback. So they would effectively encroach about five feet into that, into that 20 feet. The other 15 would stay as front yard landscaping. Staff would review this administratively and we would look at the impacts of the front yard landscaping. They'd have to replace trees or do whatever is necessary to, to keep the site into compliance with our landscaping standards. Um, so there's some other miscellaneous changes in here just to, to clarify how our mechanical equipment screening works. Uh, equipment is meant to be screened. We wanted to be clear that a charger is not mechanical equipment. So you'll see like we have that language in there to just make it clear that just normal landscaping would go along with this. Uh, we're not trying to shield each each one of these things with a six foot obscuring fence or, or however tall they would be. Um, there would also be you can see some language about signage. Uh, our signage code is typically not in the zoning ordinance. But again, if we're talking about existing sites, it's very possible that a site used up all of their signage for the main building. And then you see these Tesla logo logo chargers, or you see directional signs that might say how you're, how you're supposed to do this or where you're supposed to go. Those wouldn't be permitted. Um, so that would be a, a little bit of a problem or a disincentive to install this if you can't sign it and, and let people know um, exactly what's happening on the site. So the signage related to the chargers themselves would be exempt from the sign code, basically, just to ensure that that the signage allowance is not all used up. Um, much like a gas pump, we don't count the signage on the gas pump towards the total of the site. This would be treating basically the chargers the same as gas pumps. Um, overall, this uh, seems to be a pretty fair uh, balance of trying to allow for these things to be be created uh, knowing our existing conditions aren't going to work across the city uh, and trying to still kind of ameliorate those issues of, of front yard aesthetics as well um, the example in the staff report the first one we showed you is a is a couple of years old iteration of this which i would say was has more equipment and it shows you what happens if you have no setback requirements you're just right up against the sidewalk you're just taking all the space out uh, that is not something we were in favor of um, and so we thought this was a better balance of doing this and we're just looking for your recommendation to to bring this back to city council any questions okay these would be well tesla you said has been the is the one that has come and talked to you uh say say they want to put one in a parking lot uh somewhere here in Ames, and and another group wants to put in a non-tesla set of uh chargers in um will they be able to be like right next to each other or how would yeah so we didn't put a limit we didn't put a limit on the amount of encroachment so so let's say tesla installed eight and then <coughs> charge point showed up and they wanted to install eight so now you have 16 in a row mm -hmm. this doesn't limit that so yes okay. any any site could have any number of chargers on it um, that that's entirely possible <coughs> So the portion in uh, so item three under the new section 29, 13, 16, mm -hmm. where it references says the installation of chargers shall not impact or remove healthy existing mature trees within the front yard. What, I guess, how is that determined whether a tree falls under that criteria? Uh, I think, I think staff would look at it first. So we have a city arborist, so if we really needed to to get to that question of is it is it healthy or not? Um, we have a city arborist we could bring in for that. What we're trying to get at is just because it's convenient to run an electric line right here where the tree is, you can't remove the tree. You're gonna have to route your electrical around the tree. You're not just gonna be able to take out a tree that's a mature, let's say that tree in the background there, you know, we got a 30 year old mature tree. Oh, I'm just gonna cut it down and put back you know, two and a half inch caliber tree to meet front yard landscaping. That's not our goal. So they have some flexibility about how to route things. And that's just trying to reinforce that we're just, again, existing front yards typically have trees. Um, street trees can be involved too. So we just want to make it clear that that's not our goal is to remove trees just to get a convenient routing of electrical in. Sounds good. Thanks. Are there any other questions? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> On the first picture, this one. Yep. It that's the one you're talking about with the five. That's the encroached on the sidewalk. 
yeah, there's there's essentially no setback in that picture from the property line, right? Right. And that would not be allowed or still would be allowed? It would not be allowed. So they would have that all of that equipment have to be at least 10 feet back from the property line. Okay. Yet another thing, including with the other, this picture. The, the transformer and the solid boxes, what I'd be concerned about is any site view coming into the mm -hmm. sites. So if you go to the first picture again, you have the transformer right on the corner, which could obstruct traffic site under the street. And uh, same could happen with the... So we do have a, a site vision triangle requirement in the code. It would apply. Okay. Um, so that should be covered. We we could add something in here just to remind people that's not going to be allowed, but we do have a site vision triangle at driveways. It's not very large, but we do have a code requirement for intersections and and, uh, and driveways related to obstructions between three and 10 feet in height, or and four same, and 10 feet in height. And the same thing with the white box, the solid white boxes, uh, not having them in the site triangle. As you'd yeah. Think. So yeah, any piece of equipment, any building or structure would not be allowed in that that vision triangle normally, and this is not meant to allow for them to encroach into that either. Didn't you say it's not a very big site triangle? Um, I mean, we we follow this, the SUDOS standards for the vision triangles, which are state uniform design code for engineering, civil engineering. So that's what we follow. So like a driveway, I think only has a 10 foot um, triangle next to it. Okay. Um, intersections are different. And uh, <clears throat> Under this new order, and she said that we won't get the unsightly picture we have in this first. I think it would be more like this. Again, the green transformer would not be allowed to be there. It would need to be either in the parking lot or set set somewhere else that's 20 feet back from the property line. So, so it has to be in a parking space. Then, on the, it, they would on have a choice. Way. They, in this ordinance, you would have a choice. They could put that transformer in a parking stall or they could put it in a landscaped area that is at least 20 feet back from the street. So it's going to be cheaper to put it in the landscape area. There's going to be a little bit of interplay between how far away it is from this versus maybe siting it right next to it. But uh, like the proposal that, that if this is approved, uh, the proposal that we would see uh, would probably look like this. This is something that that Tesla just sent me to ex explain how they would do this if if this worked. So you can see on this one, uh, they're putting the driveway on the left. Or I'm sorry, they're putting the transformer far on the left uh, because that's where the 20 feet of setback is. And then right. you can see how how they have the charging pedestals and these cabinets, and then that's the separation that they have from the street. So would i mean this isn't a submitted permit but you can kind of see how they would lay that out on an existing parking lot within the restrictions that are proposed here now that one i i like how they have the transform green is the transformer yeah in the picture of the green on this one it's that left mm -hmm. red and white box yep <clears throat> now they could what i'm what i'm also saying is if they did not want to put that there and sometimes there's limitations on where electrical can be routed through a site if they really wanted to, this code would let them take out a parking spot right here and they could put the transformer in that location. Which wouldn't be a problem because it wouldn't interfere with any sight line either. Then. In this case, right. It's set into the site away from the driveway. And, that, and that's my main concern is yep. the sight lines coming in and out of parking lots and stuff. There, there are places and yep. that are just terrible. Right. So they, they shouldn't be that way going forward. We've had that site vision triangle expressly stated in the code for probably about six years. Um, I have no issue trying to clarify that that still applies within this language. Okay. With that, okay. And then the advertising of the brand, like a uh, Tesla. We want that or I mean, we don't, we don't, we allow signage. We don't care what the signage says. It's like saying, do you want a Burger King to say it's Burger King? We don't care that it says it's Burger King. So, um, 
all of these charging companies have some kind of trademark or label on them. There are other companies other than Tesla. They're just the ones that were able to give me this information to, to illustrate this. And then uh, is there going to be something in our code that says each of these charging stations have to be able to handle all the different kinds of cars? No. Because I, I don't no. know. Our, our I, code, I, I know that yeah, our federal government is, is heading towards that way. This code does not say that, nor do I know if I could even regulate that if I wanted to. I don't know if there's any law that says I have the ability to say that, um, but this does not require universal charging. Yeah, my, my understanding was that Tesla is for Tesla cars. The way they're currently designed, currently only, a, designed, yeah, yes. only a Tesla can charge a Tesla supercharger. Yeah. Now, <laughs> other, other third-party companies, that's not the case, but they're not Tesla-owned companies. Mm -hmm. So that might change just in the market because of what you're referring to from the federal government but we're not specifying they have to be a universal charger to take advantage of this. I guess by having everything be able, every brand be able to be at a charging station, it would be a more efficient use of space for the city. It probably would be, yes. So as far as I know, there's really just two. There's really just Tesla and everybody else. Um, so there's, it's kind of like Apple and yeah. everybody else, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, Android and everybody else. Well, Android is everybody else because they all use the USB ports and not lightning cables and all that other stuff. Yeah, so, and they're all so all effectively. Paid. I the way I think of it, it's it again Tesla and everybody else, just like Apple and everybody else when it comes to how you do peripherals and everything. So, uh, so I don't I don't see like okay, we're gonna get six different kinds of chargers because there's six different ways of charging your car. There's really just two. and then. For new construction, we're, this, it is not a problem. Right, new construction, we wouldn't even need to change the code to deal with it. New construction could also take advantage of this and then intentionally cite it while they do it and, and go into that 10 foot setback, uh, but it's written. Do we to, want that though? Again, I think we're just trying to treat everybody the same in, in terms of, of how we do this. Uh, you know, a lot of, again, the minimum setback for a parking lot is 10 feet. So if if you built a new site now, you could be at 10 feet. You won't be able to do the chargers. You would need to, to at least have 10 feet of landscaping before any charging equipment shows up. So if you were doing a new site, you're probably setting the parking spaces back 15 feet to give yourself that four to five foot envelope for the charging equipment and then still the 10 foot landscaping, which is, again, slightly more setback than what is the minimum. And this and the, new, the old standard or the old, old way and this way, will have some screening of some kind. Yes, yeah, so you have to meet that front yard landscaping requirement. So let's say you did go into a site that just had grass, had no gra no ornamental grasses, no shrubs or no trees, and you were to do this improvement there, we would expect you to improve uh, the front yard landscaping in relation to that area of change on the site. You don't have to redo your whole site, but in relation to your front yard, we would, we would expect that. Front so yard is what you're saying is between their property line in the street. Correct. Well, so no, if, no, no, no. Between the property, okay. The front yard is on their property, so it's the distance between, let's say, the sidewalk and then where the parking stalls start. Okay. Or where the drive aisle starts. So this new ordinance would not preclude, say, uh, well, fairway over there. If they put a charging station and everything right up next to their building. It right. Yeah. So that's allowed now. So if, if you're more than 20 feet onto the site, go to it, go mount your chargers on the building, go put your transformer back by the building. What we're, what we're seeing is that's the more way more expensive option. So they really would prefer to be able to site it in landscaping rather than go through concrete and install that mm -hmm. equipment throughout through the parking lot. So some cities have done that. I've talked to a number of different cities to review standards. It, it, I think we're kind of right in the middle of how most cities are looking at this. It's kind of accessory of pertinent equipment, some separations required, some screening or landscaping is required, but they're not holding it to um, the same expectations of like a full building or something that needed to be set way inside and have full design requirements as associated with it. If someone wants to install these and they want to take up those up, up to two vehicle parking spaces to install the equipment, um, but it would 
eliminate, uh, put them below the minimum parking requirement? Is there either in this ordinance or in the, another portion? That's what section four is trying to, to say. So if you already met exceeded minimum parking requirements, I wouldn't even care if you took those stalls out yeah. and put anything there. But if you're so at this the is, minimum. Yeah. So this is meant to say that you can essentially go two spaces below the minimum parking requirement oh, to okay. allow for okay. equipment if necessary. That's what it's trying to get to. Okay. That makes sense. And I can probably clarify that too, because that, yeah, I, I now that you say that, I read it, I understand why you would not see what I wrote, meaning what I meant. So, yes. <laughs> That's why we ask the questions, I guess. <laughs> Are there any other questions or concerns? What is there? So, what I was at, talking about earlier, is there a way to rewrite the alternatives or? Um, in what way? Um, what were you, I mean, we talked about a lot of things. So, which specific parts? The site triangle we were talking about. So if if I change it, I would do it in section one because right now it says when a standard is not addressed by this section, other zoning standards apply. So Article Four includes, you know, like seventy five other zoning standards in it. Um, so there's no exception to a site vision triangle. So the way this is written, that would be true. You have to meet the site vision triangle setbacks. Yeah, so so if so I would say so they're okay. Number one does require that set. One makes it clear that unless there's an exception listed here, you must meet all the standards of the code, which I'm saying there already is a site vision standard other in another place in the code. So the only allowances they're getting, they're getting two. Um, they're getting an encroachment into a front yard. Well, they're getting an encroachment into any setback. We're very focused on the front, but you could put this in a side or a rear. It's really just the front where we're saying that 10 foot landscaping has to exist. So they're getting the benefit of being able to go into a setback in relation to a parking lot. Um, and in the front yard, at least 10 feet of landscaping has to exist. The second benefit they're getting is that if they really needed to take out two parking spaces and it would have dropped them below minimum parking, they're allowed to do that. And then I guess potentially the signage allowance is a slight uh, exception to the code if, if you're on a site that had used all their signage up previously. Uh, then you were talking too about Tesla and everybody else. So if they want to put in additional charging stations, somebody else other than Tesla, they could take two more spaces? Or in how many more two more spaces can they do? So if they're right at the minimum parking, they can knock out two. Okay. Yeah, so the way this number four is written, I think you get two on the site. So that would not allow anybody else other than the Tesla well, one to come in. Well, assuming they were first. Yeah, yeah, presuming the Tesla had existed right. and, and they had to do that. Um, right. So the way that's written, it's, it's two on the site, not two per charging installation. So do we need to address that or I guess it's up to I you. think I think it covers it. I mean if I mean if you don't want you want more be... than two, I which is what I would Well, I I'm, I'm, I'm not I'm saying that if if the other companies other than Tesla want to get in there would this preclude them going in if they're right at the minimum parking. I, I, theoretically it could just just like all the other standards if there's not 10 feet of setback you can't go there either. Um, so if you want to be more permissive, yeah, you could add that, uh, recommend that change to, to say two per, per charging. I mean, I'll come up with a better word, but what you mean is charging installation here, right? Like right. set of, of, I, I just don't want to limit, you know, if Tesla goes into a bunch of places, they can limit. So don't problem, think they, the problem with doing that though, is if, if you're going to change that section, what are you going to change it to? Because I don't know. That's why I'm asking. Kelsey. There, in that you, you know, there's no anticipating what in the future the number of different charging stations brands. There so might ho be. Hopefully, so somebody comes up with. I would a standard that a standard plug. Until that have, I'd say yeah. just leave it as it is. Yeah, and I think just from looking across the country, uh, 
you know, in a, in a market like Ames, I'd be surprised if more than two Tesla supercharger installations were ever established in our community based on how things are now. Um, so I, you, you're not going to see superchargers at every McDonald's and every Burger King and every Wendy's and have 18 different ways to charge your car in 20 minutes in the city that they're just not this. This is a very expensive installation. So they're only going to yeah, do a yeah. few and it's going to be targeted towards highways probably in the most for the most part. Versus the level two chargers, the stuff like we have in the back, those are cheap. I mean, they're a few thousand dollars each instead of hundreds of thousands of dollars. So you'll see more level two chargers possibly pop up across and those the are city. slow chargers. I take it. Those are, yeah, those are the ones that take a couple hours to charge your car versus this is less than okay. well under an hour. I don't know what they really are, but well under an hour, 20, 30 minutes. Yeah. So the level twos could take advantage of this also, but they do not have this same kind of equipment. Like if you go in the back, right, we don't have a transformer next to our two level two chargers. They're just able to use the existing power supply, uh, put the chargers in and there's, there's really not much to it. Or if you go out to the West High V, uh, Ames Electric installed a level two charger there on the west side of the parking lot near Wells Fargo. Oh, yeah. I mean, you don't really even know it's there. Um, so those are those are not the issue. It's these large Super. these it's the large large installations that have to have a lot of power to to do this. I think they have them out there by I thirty five and thirty behind that come and go or something. I remember right. Um, I mean, Ames Electric, yeah, they might have a level. two. Yeah, I think they have one out to come and go on 13th Street. No, on the one on I-35 and 30. There's a charging station. They might have one there, too. Are there any other comments? I assume the city is the applicant here. We are. Okay. Um, is there anybody in the audience that would like to come forward and ask any questions? Seeing none, I'll close the uh, public hearing part of this this item. Are there any other questions or concerns? And if not, I would entertain a motion. I move for alternative one, recommend approval of a zoning text amendment to allow for encroachment of charger pedestals and one ancillary cabinet within setbacks for commercial parking lots or front yards when there's at least a 10 foot landscape front yard and allow for charging equipment to occupy parking spaces and modify mechanical unit screening. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The motion is approved. Item nine, the zoning text amendment on affordable housing parking rates. All right. Uh, so for this this text amendment, again, the city initiated this one uh, as we are working through the the Baker subdivision low in, low income housing tax credit apartment project proposals. It's a lot to say. <laughs> uh, well, while we're reviewing that, the city has selected a partner developer, and it's a, a 38 uh, unit townhome type um, affordable housing project, and we're going to do it through a planned unit development overlay. Uh, you guys approved rezoning that site to RM with the PUD overlay uh, to have that come through public hearings with major site plans and, and to have full review of that project. Well, within the PUD, and it's the only place in the city that we do this, so there is not an affordable housing parking standard that can be applied everywhere in the city. When we wrote the PUD ordinance, we assumed it might have um, some advantages to help different kinds of housing products get built. And we put into it a specific parking rate where council could elect to reduce parking for, for apartments, uh, which are based on a one space per bedroom standard down to two spaces uh, for an apartment unit or a rental unit. Um, as, as we look through the, um, and it was supposed to be associated with affordable housing, so some kind of deed restriction related to affordable housing. As we're working through that LIHTC project, uh, the original proposal had one and a half spaces per unit in it. We said, well, we don't currently allow for that. We, we do want to see a, a plan with two spaces per unit in it. Uh, but while we were looking at that, City Council uh, initiated a text amendment. The one and a half space that they first proposed was equal to what the Iowa Finance Authority requires. So if, if no city had a, a parking standard, Iowa Finance Authority would say you still have to do one and a half spaces per unit. Um, so that's where the proposal first came from. 
So the text amendment here is to within the PUD ordinance to lower the two down to one and a half. Uh, you would make a case by case review of that. It's not a, a by right issue. So we would take into consideration what are the size of the units? Uh, are is there on street parking in the area? What are the what are the kind of really what are the issues here? Is parking a concern? Uh, is there enough space to do the parking? There's things that you would just decide on a case by case. So if we lower it to one and a half, uh, it allows for that to be considered. Uh, if we keep it at two, then then those same factors go into it. It just doesn't get reduced as much. So that's where we're proposing to go down to one and a half. Um, and we're really, really relying on that major site plan process to make a case by case decision. So that's just giving you the authority to decide what the parking should be. Uh, effectively it'll be council because it'll have to go through the major site plan process, but it allows the city to consider lowering it based on the site plan and based on the circumstances and based on the affordability versus just like everywhere else in the city. It's just, this is the number. There's no discussion about it. So I have one question about the, the language. Um, mm -hmm. it, it reads only requires a maximum. So really, isn't that a minimum? This is a parking minimum, right? Not a parking maximum. A developer could still choose to build two stalls uh, per, but they're only required to build a minimum of 1.5 based on staff review. Is that right? Yeah, so I'm trying to think how that was. Yeah, so I, I understand exactly where you're coming from. So the normal standard would be a, at least one space per bedroom. What this was trying to say is in any circumstance, you would not ever require more than one and a half parking spaces per unit. Um, meaning if you were like a one bedroom unit, you could still have one, not have to do one and a half or two. Uh, but if you were two or more, then your maximum rate would be this one and a half. So it reduces the maximum rate. Yep. That's, that's, that's the better way to think of it. So, it, so in, in reality, the rate is still one space per bedroom. However, no more than one and a half spaces will be required for an apartment unit. That's, that's probably the better way to understand it. And I, I would say that could be reworded to make that clear, but the, yeah, but the intent here is you, it, so you have to meet the parking requirement of the code. That's what it says, mm -hmm. but then it says, we're not going to require more than one and a half of you. In the event that it's more than one bedroom per unit. Yeah. So basically two, three, four, five, you could get one, one and a half instead of five, mm -hmm. four, three or two. But if you have a five unit multifamily development is one and a half is being parked at one and a half really enough. I mean, you'd want to be parked at a, a minimum, a maximum of 0.5 probably, right? Or is that a minimum 0.5? I can't remember. I didn't quite follow that example. So if I had a five bedroom apartment unit, mm -hmm. anywhere in the city, it would be other than campus town or downtown. You would need five parking spaces. You could. Right, you but what, but but isn't the recommendation to park at 0.5 generally? That is not in our code. Not not in the Eames code. No, our our requirement, not recommendation. Our requirement is one parking space per bedroom. So with this, a five unit, not five unit, five bedroom. Sorry, five bedroom unit could could be parked at 1.5. Council could agree to that. I would say if that was the proposal, I would I would need to see a lot of reasons why that's necessary. Mm -hmm. um, or that there's only a couple of those in the project. If you came in with 35 bedroom units, I'm probably not supporting this. Yeah, unless so you're saying your target, um, you know, your target group that you're serving is really, really not going to own any cars. Mm -hmm. if you're coming in and say, I'm just going to do low income family housing. Um, you'd be pretty hard pressed to agree to that standard. Right. And you'd be able to cover that under the bud. Yeah, so all of the PUD approval is discretionary. You do, you do not have to grant deviations. So this is this is saying you have to meet the parking code. 
However, for affordable housing, the maximum required parking can be one and a half spaces per unit. Minimum or maximum required because the minimum is always going to be still okay. one per bedroom. And so the that's subject to staff review and then council approval. Yep. So a major site plan is goes through staff development review committee, comes here for a public hearing, and then goes to city council for a public hearing. So yeah, uh, I don't have great evidence of this. The only um, uh, we only had the PUD for two years. Windsor Point, which is on Trip Street, an existing development, we rezoned it to a PUD uh, because they were originally built as a senior housing had a senior housing component. Well, senior housing requires less parking than apartments, but they wanted to switch from senior to just general parking. Um, they were able to meet this standard, but through the PUD council could authorize them then to switch from senior to regular to regular apartments with no age restriction on them. And we use this allowance to kind of balance out the difference between a senior housing project with regular apartments. Now that was a very large site, over 150 units in total, not every unit needed two plus parking spaces. So it, it balanced out then between the threes and the ones and everything. But um, that's the only experience we have with, with this, um, with this kind of a parking rate. Cause again, if you're not in a PUD, you can't get a parking reduction. So is it fair to say we, if, if you looked at alternative one, you might add some language about four um, units with more than two or more bedrooms? So that the the minimum of one unit, I'm sorry, one stall per, for a one bedroom unit would still apply. Uh, we we can look at that. So when I look at the the existing land language, so this is why it's written this way, and I'm and I'm not saying I have to do it this way, but the first part of it says parking shall be provided as prescribed by this chapter. That's where the one space per bedroom requirement comes from. Then it says where the parking can be. And then the last part just says affordable housing may have reduced parking of up to a maximum. So, so to me, the first sentence sends you back to the parking code where the one mm -hmm. per bedroom standard is. Um, I get it. If you read the third sentence only, it's confusing. But if you start at the beginning with what the base code requirement is, then the third sentence makes sense. Um, but we're agreeing on what the meaning of it is. You're just saying it's not obvious to you the first time you read it, right? I, I think it's, I think it's clear now that you've explained it a little bit. Well, that's, yeah. that's what we do. We explain <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah. Cause it, yeah, it's assuming, you know, the base requirement and then it's telling yeah. you what the reduction is. That's, that's the key, the base requirement. So you have to know that first, um, which is kind of how a lot of zoning ordinances are where it builds off of other things you must know to understand that section, which is why we get a bad rap um, for readability and usability. But, um. So you said, I think you said earlier that the Iowa Finance Authority requires one and a half parking spaces per unit for affordable housing. Is that right? At least for family housing. They might allow less for senior, I'm not sure, but for, for family, basically anything that's not senior, it's one and a half. Okay. So if, if there were a building that were all one bedroom apartments, um, would the... Ames code rule of one parking space per bedroom or would the Iowa finance rule of one and a half spaces per unit apply so, to that building? So both would apply. So the state can't overrule our local zoning, but they won't fund a project that doesn't meet their standards. Okay. So you have to meet both. Okay. So even though they're okay with one and a half, if our code's two, they got to do two. If we go all the way down to uh, 1.5 instead of like 1.7, wouldn't we run the risk of uh, pushing cars out into the neighborhood? Theoretically, I, I think you have to buy into the philosophy that if you're in a in a low income project because you make 30% of average median income, which means your family of four is earning less than $30,000 a year, you're probably not affording to own two cars. That's where this is really coming from. So when you really start to talk about what the income levels are, and I get it as a family gets bigger, there's possibility of two cars with that household with, with family housing, it, it can happen. Teenagers. Yep. It could happen. It just that 
the target audience is not a two car household. Uh, so that one and a half is viewed as that guest parking could be employee parking. It can be resident parking, but yes, the, the street would be potentially overflow. If <clears throat> they won't get kicked out of the affordable housing, if they, the family grows and more income is in that family, in that family, is it? That depends on the program. Some, some programs are designed to only support at a certain affordability level. And if you income gets out of that, you're not eligible in that program anymore, then you might not be housed in that, that unit any longer. Some are designed to allow you to grow your income and retain um, placement in a, in a unit to a point. So, so it the, depends. So the people in this development could potentially uh, I'm not going to grow, grow their income and grow, have more cars. That's what I'm getting at is 1.5 is fairly, yeah, so I'm not fairly gonna... a, a, a steep decline. And uh, should we be making that big a jump right off the bat? So I'm not going to say I know all, I don't know all of the ins and outs of the LIHTC program about when you can stay unit in a unit or not. In this particular application, it's targeted to 50% of AMI or less. And then we have reservations of certain units down to 30% of AMI. Uh, I do know those 50% AMI units that the, in this particular project, for sure, they can have income levels of up to 60% and and stay in the unit so it's i i know for sure there's some allowance there for you to stay i just don't know um absolutely if you got to 120 percent of median income could you stay i i'm, I don't I'm not really concerned about them you know it being able to grow income is is good for somebody in low income what i'm concerned 100%. about is the pushing out of the of the vehicles into the surrounding yeah so i mean we're talking about like on this on this Baker subdivision site, we're talking about 14 park parking spaces. So we're talking a row of parking that doesn't exist. You're taking out green space developer costs somewhere between 70 and a hundred thousand dollars to create those. Um, when you look at the site plan, you would have to judge. Is there really, if someone did, did park on the street, are you really impacting somebody? What are the likelihood of that really being a, a common issue? Those are the things you're going to look at in the site plan. And we have a mix of two, threes, and four bedrooms. So it, they're definitely family units. We have some four bedrooms and a lot of three bedroom units. So I, I, I would not go less than one and a half. Uh, I think no. that's that's that to me would be pushing it unless you're really looking at exclusively extremely low income or you're really looking at 30% AMI or less, not above. And there really is no no car ownership that's really a, a really statistically likely for any of those kind of target populations in this in this project there's definitely going to be car ownership it's just how much is it really going to be right i'm just concerned about whether i know it's not right but the parking in front of your house people think it's theirs and are we creating a problem for the police to deal with later on there's no police problem if you park on the street and it's allowed, there's no thing to call the police about. Oh, there is. <laughs> it happens. It happens. So it's not an offense. Well, I know it's not an offense, but I, so that's why I'm saying you, we can theoretically say that might happen in the city, but till you see the project and understand where it's situated and what that mix of units are, like I said, I would not go below one and a half. Should it be 1.7 possibly? Um, two is definitely a comfortable number. 1.7 is probably not a problem. 1.5 is probably where I would say is the most that you would go without, again, really extreme, um, income, low income kind of target population. Right. I, I agree with you. 1.5 should be a, a bottom. And then, but there is no, there at the same time, there is no relief to go down for an extremely low income project to go below one. Um, so there, there is, there is, that isn't even built into the code right now. So it's one and a half no matter what so yeah we're really relying on the case by case site plan to say one and a half could work we'll decide that as we go um, versus just saying there's no way it could work 
we're just going to stick with 1.7. I, I wouldn't go higher than 1.7. I think 1.7 would be, oh. um, again, so then we would have three or four more spaces instead of 14 more spaces. Right. I agree. It'd be a 1.7 would be a, a good compromise for this project, for this project, not necessarily, but you on the PUDs, you guys, your department makes the decision, right? We'll make a recommendation. Recommendation, yeah. yes. And and if there's no on street parking, like there's there's a lot of circumstances where maybe this doesn't work. I know you're concerned about having on street parking. I would be more concerned if there was no on street parking about lowering it. So I do view the street as the relief valve um, for those times when maybe you know maybe ten times a year you do need more than one and a half spaces, but ninety nine percent of the time you don't. Um, that's why I need on street parking. Are there any other questions? Then I'd open it up for anybody in the audience that would like to come up and speak or if they have questions. Seeing none, I'll close the public forum. Is there any uh, further questions for Kelly? I just did want to clarify one thing. Uh, our, just to tell you what our regular code is, I, I implied that a one bedroom only needs one space. A one bedroom needs one and a half spaces. Then when you get to two or more, it goes to one space per bedroom. So the one and a half would be universal. You'll never be at just one unless you're in a different area of the city. Senior units require one space. I do have one other question yep. for you. If it's at 1.5 for one bedroom, realistically, each unit has to have two parking spaces, correct? No, we aggregate it. We we apply it as a ratio to all your units, and we just round up right, the last unit. Right. But are, is that on-site? Is that the driveway, or is that? We have a parking stall, so a striped stall. Right. Striped stall, yep. OK. Yep. So that one and a half only comes to play on the last unit, whether you round up or down. We don't apply it per units to the total. Is there any further discussion or questions? If not, I would entertain a motion. I'll make a recommendation. To alternative number two, recommend city council approve a reduction to the minimum required parking for affordable housing uses uses in PUDs from two spaces per residential unit unit to 1.7 spaces per residential unit. We have a motion. Is there a second? Hearing none, the, uh, the uh, alternative for the uh, Motion fails. Is there anybody else that would like to uh, make a motion? I recommend alternative one that the city council approve a reduction to the minimum required parking for affordable housing uses and PUDs from two spaces per residential unit to one and a half per residential unit. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Nay. Motion is approved. And that brings us back to going back to item six, election of officers for the next year. So I believe we do chair first and vice chair second. Does that sound familiar to everyone? I think that's what we did last year. No, I don't think we did it that way. Did we? We I think we nominated for each. Oh, nominated did the did the chair first and then we did the know what i just said that's what he just said i think we voted i, I don't care how we do it vote, vote on the chair first then do vice chair second is what I, that, I think that's what we did before yeah is there anybody would like uh, to nominate anybody as the new chair or is there anybody who would like to volunteer i, I will if there's a, Unless I can nominate. Let's nominate Mike. Michael Sullivan. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, think, I can say Mike and it's everybody. I was going to say that's about everybody here. I and mean, I think you 
don't think we accept self nominations. You can ask somebody if they can nominate. I don't think we let, accept self nominations. If somebody has to be nominated, they have to accept the nomination. That's how we've done it every other year. Right. So I would nominate Mike Sullivan. I'll, yeah, I'll, it's up to you. I'm okay with you, that. It's yeah. up to you. Yeah. Okay. We have a nomination. Is there are there any other nominations for for chair? It's easy. Got the notes. Okay. <laughs> uh, and you said we'd just go ahead and vote for the for the for this one. Okay, we have a nomination of Mike Sullivan for chair for the next year. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. It's passed. Okay, we need uh, somebody to uh, take the position of vice chair, uh, which really their only duty is if the chair isn't able to be here, then then they 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 monitor or they run the meeting. And in this last year, I don't think that happened once. There was a couple of times where I was awful close to seven o'clock when I got here, but, <laughs> but I did make it to all the meetings. Uh, is there anybody who would like to nominate somebody for the vice chair? Nobody wants it. I'll try it again. Okay. Since the pressure, I'll, I'll was, on, nominate, the pressure was on me. I'll nominate John. <laughs> okay. Are there any other nominations? Does anyone else want to be nominated? No. Okay. No. Okay. Next, that, next year. <laughs> next That's year. why I volunteered. Yeah. Okay. We have a nomination of John for the uh, for the vice chair position. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. Okay. Are right. we have a new new uh, crew of uh, Mike Sullivan and John? I forget your last name. <laughs> Mike. The Sullivan or no, me? Camry. Camry, I should know that. Okay. Okay, got it. That brings us to item number 10 commission comments. Anybody have any questions, concerns? Anything next time? I would say it's very unlikely we have the next meeting. It's likely we will. Un unlikely. Unlikely. Unlikely we have a, a second meeting in April. So if that if that preliminary plat resubmits, which based on conversation today, that's not going to happen. It's highly, highly unlikely we'll have that meeting on in April. And I have a question for you about the oh, the driveway. I think it was, <laughs> what was it that uh, I was talk asking is it about the garages oh, it's, oh. In the it's in the minute it's in the minute okay the last meeting okay yeah. i mean i'm probably gonna take that outside of the media yeah. that's okay. all right it was about the the garage being being yeah the garage i thought the garage is being forward of the houses i thought you said ames wanted garages pushed back from the front of the houses it's only required in PUDs. PUDs are the only, so if you choose to take advantage of the PUD to make smaller lots and, and everything else, then we wanted the garage not to, to be the, to not be the most forward component of the house. So only in PUDs is that required. Okay. And what you looked at was a PRD, which is the older okay. standard that had no architectural standards associated with it. That was the question I had last time that okay. they couldn't answer. Any staff comments? I do not. With that, I would accept a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn.